Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to day two of the inaugural homeschool conference. It's just really been a blast. Many of us are exhausted from sessions. So, oh, one second here. There we go. So this is a chance for those of you who are participating live to indicate where you're participating from. Look for the star to the left of the map. Click on it twice. To click twice and then click on the map. North Carolina is getting crowded there. Yay. So if you put a note in the chat where you're where your where your exact location, time, temperature. And good, at least we've we're, we're not just strictly continental US. Looks like we have Canada, Sweden, India. Very fun. Feel free to keep that going in the chat. We are going to move on from the map. Cindy, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, just want to apologize up front. Uh, I decided to put video on, but my eyes, I've had surgery, uh, about four surgeries in the last half year on my eyes. So if I want to look at the chat, I'm going to be looking forward and, and such like that. So forgive uh, my having to look closer at the screen. To see. So, I'd like to introduce myself. Well, first, this is the, the keynote called Learning Disabled or Learns Differently Understanding and Honoring the Natural Learning Path for Right Brain Children. I'd like to introduce myself and my family. My name is Cindy Gaddis, and I'm an unschooling mother to seven children six boys, one girl, five by birth, two by adoption, and now I've added another son in law by marriage. We chose to homeschool from the beginning, so we're in our 21st year. My oldest son was a strong personality who knew how he wanted to learn, and he became my best teacher. I'm sorry, the screen is blank, but it's a, it's a visual about schools. Like most of you, I was public schooled. So when I began my formal journey with homeschooling, I started with what I knew. I replicated school in our home. However, my son was having nothing to do with it. Some may struggle, like this young man, or like mine, some will outright reject it defiantly. This is because the school scope and sequence favors the left brain learning traits. Children who reject or struggle with this system of learning are often right brain dominant learners. These are people who favor creativity and innovation. These are smart children forced to learn in a mismatched environment. So, they are, I forgot about this slide. So yes, they are imaginative, they are pictorial, which is the opposite of what we see in school. So, how do schools deal with these children who learn differently? First, schools are no-fault zones. I have rarely heard a teacher or administrator say that the way they teach or the structure of the school is wrong for the child. Instead, they blame the child. In order to explain the discrepancy between this intelligent, creative child and his lack of success in school must be because of a learning disability. Behind almost every learning disability label is a right brain learner. This must raise a red flag. So, if schools teach primarily in a left brain fashion, and most of us went to school, that means our culture learned to value these traits. So, we need to start by understanding the learning traits of right brain children so that we can begin to expand our educational value system. 
So what are those traits? Here's this list. The brain is divided into two equal halves. They are mere images of each other. It makes sense, therefore, that the traits most associated with each side of the brain are opposite from one another. So if you look at this list, that means if school teaches in a left brain manner, then they teach the opposite to what our right brain children need. And you'll see each of these words are opposite from one another. So they really need opposite teaching methods and time frames in everything about um, learning. So what I want us to do is to test our current educational value system so that you can see what I'm talking about, that we have learned to value left brain traits. All right. So if you saw this, if your child or your student were to produce the work on the left, or the one on the right, which one would you value more? Yet even if you were to be impressed with both of them, which would you more likely share with a friend or relative as evidence of learning? What you're actually seeing here are two different children favoring different learning styles that represent the same goal. On the left, my daughter was an early word focused person. She had read a story and she wanted to model that story by copying the text word for word. So this is a copied book, word for word. On the right, my son is a picture-focused learner. He had seen the Lion King movie and also wanted to model that story by copying it image by image. But what do we do when we see the written format? We congratulate the child on work well done. We value word-based expressions. What do we do when we see the picture format? We might encourage the child to write a few sentences to represent the picture. We don't recognize the benefit of picture-based expressions enough to value it as a learning model. The universal gift of a left brain learner is word-based thinking. And the universal gift of a right brain learner is picture-based thinking. Both need to be valued. Only one is valued in our school. I just find that so fascinating to, to see that and, and to, I had to, to uh, challenge my own thinking and what I, what I value. All right, let's go to the next test. So what if your child or student shows you these two examples? On the left, how many of you would be on the phone for a dyslexia evaluation if your child handed him a page full of reversals? How satisfied are you if you see a long division problem done well? What you're seeing here is three-dimensional and two-dimensional processing at work. Right brain dominant learners not only see things in pictures, they see it three-dimensionally. It's particularly prevalent in the early years, before the brain fully integrates all its abilities. A three-dimensional ability means being able to view an object from all angles. Thus, you can draw a cat walking to the left or to the right. You can view it from above or from beneath. So why can't you do the same for letters and numbers? That is what may be thinking with these visual children, especially when they're younger. My builder son discovered his easy ability to write near image and spent hours and weeks playing around with the phenomenon. He'd write these out and go to the mirror and he'd be so excited, look mom, look, read this. Da Vinci was known for all his writing being a mirror image without even realizing it. This shows a strong three-dimensional ability. Numbers and letters are two-dimensional symbols. The number one actually represents one object of something. It would be a right brain thinker who would quickly understand that one plus one doesn't always equal two. One horse and one apple doesn't equal two animals, for instance. Left brain dominant thinkers are early two-dimensional processors, and they flourish with sequencing, so long division will come easily to them. Right brain dominant thinkers are early three-dimensional processors, so concepts will come more easily to them. Both need to be valued, but only one is valued in school. Just seeing uh, what uh, comments are being used. Oh, that's so cool. That someone someone mentioned that uh, someone would leave mere image messages for them. I think that's awesome. All right, next challenge. 
if you see your child reading a thick book, or if you see his own Lego creation, which do you value more? And I'm talking about which would you hold up as evidence of learning? Because you could value or you could be impressed with both, but which one would you share with your friend or relative that your child is learning? The early universal gift for left brain thinkers is word-based thinking and sequential processes. These translate well to learning to read. The early universal gift for right brain thinkers is picture-based thinking and imagination. These translate well to expressing themselves through the creative outlets. Lego building is one such creative outlet. Without a doubt, my builder son's hours and hours and years and years of Lego building led to his math and computer skills today. Both need to be valued. Only one is valued in school. What we saw there in each of these three examples represented the expression of the universal gifts for each of the brain processing preferences. Um, as you see, the universal gifts for the right brain learner is extraordinary imaginations and thinking in pictures, three-dimensional pictures. Uh, it, we know that all children are imaginative, but you'll see an extra measure of imagination in a right brain child. They'll do a lot of pretending. I have a, a child that's always in costume, one that would always create elaborate play scenes with his figures. Uh, these are the learners that would be most likely to have imaginary friends. They are also, while young, often skew the line between reality and pretend. So you have to be, with their sensitivities, they have very high sensitivities. You have to be aware of TV and other media in the early years. They can often become very uh, scared because they can't quite tell if, if that's a real image of a dinosaur. Even though I know it's pretend, I'm so visual and I'm so imaginative, I kind of worry that maybe they're real. Um, being aware of social customs like Santa Claus, this really taps into their imagination. And they really believe these things to a higher degree than other children. And they can be quite traumatized when they discover that it's not real. Um, the thinking in pictures, three-dimensional pictures, is really the very reason many subjects develop later, such as math facts, writing, reading, spelling, handwriting. These all develop later because those are two-dimensional activities. And that usually starts for right brain learners between 8 and 10 years old because they're later in developing these traits because of these universal gifts that they have that they're developing in the young years, people will want to label them as learning disabled because the time frame difference does not match that which is found in school. But as I say, school favors left brain thinking. And we're measuring our right brain children against a left brain measuring stick. And so that's where the learning disabilities start to be start to surface and people start to wonder we have to figure out how to label this child to, to explain why this smart child is not uh, able to accomplish these skills that we think every child should be able to do. But it's just not true. They have a different time frame. So let's see. Uh -huh. I just realized there's another chart missing. Maybe. Maybe not. All right. No, here we go. If you'll look at this chart depicting the natural developmental learning time frame for each of the brain processing preferences, you'll notice that the left brain time frame aligns perfectly with what we see in school. The right brain time frame does not, and thus why trouble begins for these different learners. And I only call them different because of our current value system declaring the left brain measuring stick as the gold standard. It doesn't make it true. It's only one way to learn, and there's also another way. If you look at the right brain time frame for learning, each of the subjects also get covered just in a different order. Now, I call the five to seven year time frame the foundational stage of growth. This is the time early in brain development processing that each learner relies heavily on their dominant side and the traits associated thereof in developing them. This will lay the foundation for later learning for each of the learners, both right brain and left brain learners. For the left brain child, as you see in this, reading, arithmetic, spelling, and writing 
are often introduced at five to seven years old. This works perfectly for the traits that left brain, uh, a left brain dominant learner has as their universal gifts. This is the time that they're going to really engage in those universal gifts to develop those traits well enough that will help them in the later uh, subjects that they will uh, learn. For right brain children in this stage, the creative outlets, history, science, social studies, and geography are best suited to develop their universal gifts of imagination and three-dimensional pictorial thinking. You think about it, history has a story, so you can visualize that. Geography, you can visualize where these places are and cultures. You can, science, you can visualize what's happening um, in science experiments. It's all very three-dimensional, so it makes perfect sense why they would be attracted to these subjects at this stage. For the transition stage, briefly, the eight to 10 years old, this is where I say that in this, in my book that I've written, by the way, called The Right Size Normal, uh, in my early chapters, I, I state different um, uh, brain research uh, that's out there that shows evidences of these shifts that happen and what's happening. Uh, in the transition stage, I call it that because you're starting to transition from your dominant side to starting to understand how to more efficiently use your non-dominant side. And then the integration stage is where they've seen that the brain comes most off all together, that everything is working together efficiently. You know, it takes time to learn how to use your brain well. And you're going to start with your strengths and continue to move on into the less dominant side until you're fully integrated. So that's the different um, stages of the brain development. And so if you see how schools teach, they really very much follow that left brain time frame, the left brain um, traits and valuing those and how they start integrating the right side and then they fully integrate the right side. But we need the right side to start early integrating the left side until it's fully um, complete. So, if I see any comments. All right, let's talk about the creative outlets. These activities are the first to be cut in most schools. Some of these have never even been in schools. When children pursue these interests, they are considered extracurricular at best, a waste of time at worst. For a right brain creative learner, these activities are at the core of how they learn. Many will translate these into careers. So let's see how the creative outlets translate to learning. First, let me use samples from my artist son's favorite creative outlet, drawing. I will show him how his progression toward writing followed the brain development pattern for a right brain dominant learner. Currently, our traditional educational value system for writing is putting words to paper. Writing with words, however, is simply one way to express your ideas. There are many more ways to express your ideas besides through words. They say a picture paints a thousand words. So drawing is certainly one way to express your ideas. Following the brain development chart I just shared with you, it would make sense that my young artist son primarily focused on picture-based thinking during the five to seven year time frame, since it's a foundational trait. As noted before, this picture shows my son capping a storyline from a movie he saw. This is how he was starting to learn how other people express their ideas in sequence, so he wanted to model that. So he replicated that through copying. So copying can actually be a viable way to learn uh, instead of called uh, something negative in school. It was all pictures and no words. I gave it value at the time, even though I knew nothing about how brain research backs his natural process. During this time frame, he also extensively told oral stories to anyone who would listen including into audio cassettes. As he transitioned into the next brain development stage, <coughs> excuse me, of eight, excuse me, <coughs> of eight to 10 years old, as seen on the right-hand side of this slide, his drawing suddenly began to include words. Most notably, he began a three-year-long foray into comic book making. Since this stage is what I call the transition stage of brain development, where the learner begins to transition using more of his left dominant side of the brain, 
it makes sense that pictures would still be prevalent, which is the strength of the right side of the brain, while beginning to add words, which is the strength of the left side of the brain. And by the way, another trait for a right brain learner is that they are process people, not uh, product people. Many parents complain that their creative child doesn't finish projects. I remind them of two things. First, there are careers that don't ever have to be finished, like a comic strip writer. Comics are ongoing. Second, we need big picture, creative, innovative thinkers to come up with the out-of-the-box ideas. They can always hire left-brain finishers. We need each other. Anyway, another activity my artist son was engaged in during this transition stage of 8 to 10 years old was movie making. Again, this is using a primary visual with added spoken words. Finally, as my son entered the integration stage of 11 to 13 years old, where full efficient use of both sides of the brain is achieved, my artist son uses just words. Now, this is not something I said, okay, you're at this stage, you know, only draw pictures. Okay, you're at this stage, now you may add words. Now you're at this stage, I will not allow you to use pictures. This was a natural progression. I didn't know any of this stuff. What I did is, as I discovered all of these children um, who reminded me a lot of my children, but I heard a lot of words that were about struggle and reluctance and learning disabilities, and I thought, what's the difference that happened in our life that was um, different from what I'm hearing in, in the regular world, and I started translating what I discovered, and then I, I started researching and saw that the research was validating everything that I saw in my children. All right, so this sample comes from a 100-page handwritten script he created in anticipation of a two-week visit from his friends or his, who were his movie-making companions. Uh, this is some, he was never a big hand writer, as some of them are not, but when it became something really important to him, he sat and did this on his own uh, initiation. Another activity he began during the same stage is writing a novel based on his favorite video game, Zelda. He had never been taught to write, nor had he written in this traditionally valued format, yet he had been valued for the type of idea expression that was natural to him and that that was enough to produce excellent writing. Expressing ideas by putting words to paper is valued in school. Expressing ideas through drawing, oral storytelling, movies, comics, and other avenues like dance, theater, or showmanship should be equally valued. Let's see what time we're looking at here. Good. All right. My builder son will represent the natural path to a learner who is excited about math. Left brain learners tend to do better with arithmetic, what we call math facts. Right brain learners tend to gravitate to mathematics or the concepts of how numbers work. There is a difference. Our schools very much focus on math facts, which is two-dimensional and symbolic. I saw my natural math son interact with math in a very different way than found in school. I know the two major uh, worries of most parents I talk to are if their child learns their math facts and if their child learns to read. And both of these activities tend to happen beginning in the 8 to 10 year old range for right brain children because of how their brain works. And I'm going to continue to explain that. So first, as you see in this, this photo I've got uh, that represents the math numbers, my builder's son integrated pictures on his path to understanding math in the same manner my artist son did on his path to writing. I thought that was so fascinating when I discovered this as I was translating what, what was happening in our, in our home. But here I had this perfect example of uh, coming to writing in a traditional format but in a right brain way by my son, and I saw the same similar pattern for my son with math. This builder's son was heavily involved with trains and the complex construction of tracks starting at about two years old. There's absolutely a spatial element to train track construction. I have older children that can't put the train track constru constructions together like this child did at three and four and five. He spent hours, hours putting tra train tracks together. When he started to put some math to paper, he integrated his love and understanding of trains. 
This was in his 8 to 10 year stage, where an integration of symbols and pictures were observed. I found it fascinating that he, as he explored the idea of number order, he likened it to how his train cars link together in sequence. So he's taking a, a visual object that links as he's learning the order of, of how numbers link. So how did he explore math in his five to seven year visual stage? He discovered math manipulatives. I think I just had these sitting around. I was, talk, I was talking to my older son about math concepts. And he's a mere five years old in this picture. And he saw this pentomino book with these pentominoes that gave challenge activities. And he was so excited to see this new kind of puzzle. He was fascinated. Um, at the time, he was also um, had become involved with Lego, around four years old. He was creating mazes at five, six, and seven, and puzzles at this stage. Um, he started with uh, typical puzzles, and he moved to three-dimensional puzzles at the eight to ten years stage. So again, you see that three-dimensionality, and you see this. He, he was basically developing his spatial awareness, because these math manipulatives are really about object, spatial, three-dimensionality. This is something that what I discovered is very important to a math mind. And he was naturally drawn to it without my having to say, you are now going to develop your spatial awareness. All right, during the transition stage of 8 to 10 years old, my builder son eagerly took an interest in concepts of math, including what we called math fat tricks. I tell him about a trick. Uh, did you know that you can double when you're doing 5 plus 6? You can use a double 5 plus 5 and then add 1. And he just found that so exciting. Wow, that's a math trick. And he would go and explore that concept. In North Carolina, homeschoolers need to give a standardized test to our children to fulfill the law. I talked about the concept of multiplication with my builder son, but he hadn't actually worked any uh, math fact problems themselves. I usually just give each section of the test to my child and tell them to go ahead and just do it and tell me when they're finished, secretly timing them. I would forgot to tell my son not to worry about the multiplication problems he would come across because we hadn't practiced any. When I went back to share this insight to him, he looked at me strangely and informed me he had already completed the test, including the multiplication. Unconvinced, I looked at his answers, sure that they would be wrong. Well, they were right. I asked him, how, him to show me how he would figured out the answers, and this is what he showed me here on the right, under patterns. Not only did he understand the concept, he also was already zeroing in on the idea of patterning in mathematics. And so he used a simple pattern formula. The left brain thinker in me would have simply added 23 18 times. I was astounded at his natural math intuition. I mean, when I stumble across these kind of things with my kids, I really would be just in awe on their different way of thinking than me. I, I am very strongly left brain. All of my children are right brain. I got to uh, have that great learning experience to see nobody learning like me. And so I'd be quite fascinated to see their process of learning that differed so much from mine, but so impressed with what I saw. Is everyone seeing this pattern and how he did that? I just found that very fascinating. All right. At the integration stage of 11 to 13, my builder son naturally morphed into applied math by beginning to learn computer programming. I saw in my builder son that a math mind is one who enjoys puzzling things out. I discovered that it was best for him to figure out his own way of doing things, like that long division problem. I'm going to go back to it. This long division problem was my son's way of doing long division. Um, most right brain children, even at the 8 to 10 year old stage, will often get lost in this huge sequencing way that we do long division. And I'm here to tell you there are many other ways to do, uh, for instance, three digit uh, multiplication that is much more well matched to a right brain way of thinking, and the same with division. I let him puzzle out. I try to teach him the traditional way, i.e. the left brain way, and he just got so confused. So this is what he did. And even though I thought it seemed a longer way to do things, eventually, when he hit the 11 to 13 year stage, he naturally uh, 
let me call it, uh, he made it more efficient by ended, it ended up looking the same way as a left brain person would do it, but he had to get it to it in his own time and in his own uh, understanding of that process. All right. So, math facts done a particular way are valued in school. Puzzles, mazes, math manipulatives, spatial challenges, Lego, train building, and exploring math concepts should also be valued. Let me lose my time. Good. All right. Other ways that creative outlets enhance my children's early learning lives was as a means of inspiration. So video games often inspired my son to write stories, my artist son, and it inspired my uh, builder son. He told me just recently, he said, yeah, I would play my video games and I would think, how does this work? And he would want to figure out how it worked. And he started, actually, by creating video games on paper. He would, uh, I, didn't, I didn't bring a sample of his, uh, what I call builder art, but it was very um, mazy, if you would. Uh, creative outlets can be used as a way to express themselves. As I said earlier, this is the way he learned to express his ideas was through theater showmanship, and in his case, it was through movie making. But people who act on stage are sh sharing their expression of their idea in body form. They use creative outlets as a way to translate their creativity into a product. So when there is this idea in their head, they want to translate that. So they're going to, he learned how to sew, never sewed before ever, because he wanted to create his own costume for an anime convention he was going to. Buying a costume would cheapen the experience for him in the creative visual that he had in his mind that he felt would be lowered in its quality by a store-bought costume. So he would go through months of learning how to sew so that he could translate that visual into his image of what he wanted to look like. Very fascinating to me. Um, creative outlets can be used as a reflection of a subject interest. This is actually my husband's creative outlet, which is English gardening. And it stems from his passion for all things England, including his, its history, culture, architecture, people, customs, and their gardens. Creative outlets is a way to represent their visual translations. This is my son, who is around seven years old in this picture, who had visited grandma's house, where she had a small bucket of Lego. He used every piece available to build the photos from the bucket. I'd been so amazed I had to take this picture. I just couldn't believe he took the picture on the bucket and could create it uh, with no instructions. I just, that amazes me. A person who does not see any pictures in her head, this amazes me. You can also use creative outlets to explore other subjects. When my builder's son found out that pyramids had mazes in them, that was all it took to spark his curiosity to explore through building. If I had bothered to take the top off this pyramid, you would have found intricate mazes inside. That's showing three-dimensional processing at work. I would have just drawn a simple exterior pyramid, but inside this was as in intricate as it was outside because these kids see and visualize everything and they want it to look right. Creative outlets showcase how one set of traits can translate to another. Now, as you've, you've been noticing, my builder son is one who really um, was developing his spatial ability um, through math and mazes and such. Well, we also all know that math and music often go together. Again, I didn't say, wow, this kid likes math. I need to get him in music. What actually happened is I decided to get a piano to teach myself to play. I play very verbally. I see the note is an A, and I find the A on the piano. Then I see the next note is an F, and I find the F on the piano. And then I hope that I can remember that the A and the F are there and to be able to memorize, to be able to play. It's a tedious process for me, but I enjoy it. But I play verbally, which is very normal if you think about that I am a left brain learner and I think in words. So I am taking 
a creative outlet, which tends to be more right brain, and I'm interacting with it in a left brain manner. My builder son noticed my playing, and it interested him. He sat down, and he understood the notes in a very different way than I did. He read them spatially. He saw that a note fell in space on the page, and that that note and space on the page represented a place on the keyboard in space. He saw how the space between the notes translated to a space on the piano. He had no idea that the names, what the names of all the notes were, yet he could play flawlessly and much better than I. And then the, that, in that moment, I'd always had an interest in music, was when I realized how concert pianists are created. It is from the right brain strength of spatial ability to read music in space. His visualization skills were so well developed also that after playing a favorite song for about a week, he could remove the music and see it in his head. It would appear almost like a photographic memory, but it was actually a well developed visualization skill of a right brain person. I remember being at one of his, um, he went to one of his music lessons and instructor asked, have you got this piece memorized yet? And he would say, I don't know, because he did not go out to memorize the piece. It just became part of his memory. So he would remove the music to test himself to see if he had it memorized. And as he was playing, he was giggling. And the instructor asked him, you know, why are you giggling? He said, because I can see it in my head. So I thought that was just so fascinating because I don't see things in my head. All right. We talked about my builder son's interest in mazes in the math section. And mazes and puzzles are one of those um, creative outlets that are uh, something that some of our right brain kids are drawn to. And this is one of his hand-drawn mazes, because you might have thought, oh, he took some maze books. books. That's probably a left brain version of it. Someone else had to make the mazes, and we left brain people then do the mazes as a little, um, what do you call it, um, exposure to spatial awareness. No, he hand drew his own mazes. And this is in the five to seven year stage. Um, it was, it might have been closer to the seven, eight, as he's including both sides where he included pictures still. Um, I valued his spatial ability and he continued to improve into the next stage as he gets, got older. I think nine, ten years old. So you see the pictures in this first, uh, representation of his mazes and then voila, the pictures disappear and it's a more complex maze because it was value. I saw that there was value in what he was doing. I didn't know what it was until I saw it continue to progress. And again, it's another great representation where they start with pictures to help themselves as they develop that skill and then the skill gets more and more developed and it's valued and so his spatial skills continue to improve because of the value he was receiving. All right, so isn't it fascinating that as they utilize their foundational strength first, pictures in this case, and it's valued, it truly does continue to evolve into our more valued system of non-pictures. In a study published in the Journal of Educational Psychology, researchers discovered that spatial talent was indeed important to the success in STEM domains. You know, that's kind of all the, the, the fad going on right now, talking about the STEM um, uh, fields. And they're realizing, you know what, spatial talent's very important. And yet, is there any spatial development in our schools today? Is there any value given to that at five, six, and seven, year old, seven years old? No, they're focusing on this left brain foundational trait. And that's great for left brain people. There, there are people who match up well in that environment, but there are equally a, a number of people, and in fact, Linda Krieger Silverman, who wrote a book called Upside Down Brilliance, uh, who has a, a focus in uh, visual related uh, learners who are gifted, said that 30% of children in school are heavily right brain dominant, and another 30% are moderately so. So we're talking the majority of students, 60% of students in schools actually need to have a more right brain focus on learning, and yet it is not there at all. But I do think that that's probably why the um, 
increase in Montessori uh, attendance happen because Montessori is better matched for right brain learners? Looking at the time here. Okay. All right. Um, the creative outlets are much more than extracurricular for right brain creative learners. It's a foundational need to develop the very traits that will help them be successful in other subjects. Everything will be translated to a picture for right brain children. So if we don't value their need to be exposed to a lot of images at five to seven where they are gathering this library of images in their minds that they will later use to translate things, it will be harder for them to transition into learning to read because everything they read, they will translate to a picture. So for instance, right brain people are better silent readers than those who read out loud because in their early stages of learning to read, they skim across the top, which is their natural way of uh, learning to read, so that they can catch enough of the visual to translate to a picture. So therefore, in the early stages, they will actually possibly read only every third word because that's all they need to catch a visual. They're going to read encyclopedia before they read the word the because encyclopedia has a visual that can go with it, and the does not. And where do we start with learning to read in school? Those dose words. And those dose words often don't have visuals. The, is, was, here. And, and, and parents of right brain children are freaking out because their child can't read the. And yet, they're reading these bigger words and they don't understand. Well, this is the reason why. Everything has to be translated to a visual. If they didn't uh, develop their visualization skill, so if they're, they're bogged down in decoding instead of, for instance, listening to someone read aloud to them, because as, as, as mother or teacher reads aloud to them, they're practicing visualizing or translating the spoken word into pictures. And so it's a, an easier process that they've gotten practice of visualizing so that when they start to decode, they will be able to do that a little better. Another reason why Right brain children will, for instance, go to comic books first because if you're talking about this stage, what does comic books have? Visuals. That means the visuals already been translated for them and they can focus on the decoding part. So yet we consider comic books uh, below reading. It's not uh, appropriate reading. And yet if you look at the vocabulary, it's actually quite extensive and quite well done. Many, many right brain children have learned to read on Kelvin and Hobbes, for instance. So going on, I gave some, some examples of why if we develop these skills at the five to seven year old stage the way it's meant to, they will be better prepared to do the skills they're ready for at eight to ten. And yet that is not valued. And, and as much as we sometimes, as unschoolers for instance, think we're rejecting it, we don't realize that we have this value system, this educational value system that we have to de-school from. That is really what de-schooling is all about. All right, so we need to value these things. But if you look at the five to seven year stage, the creative outlets aren't the only early subject strengths for right brain children. Briefly, since we're running out of time, I want to give some question and answer time. Briefly, we've got um, science, especially dinosaurs for boys. History, especially it seems ancient histories. Notice our creative children process the information they're learning through their preferred creative outlet. That is what creative outlets also do, is help them process new information. Cultures or social studies. This particular left-hand um, example isn't a representation from our five to seven-year folders, but it does show where it goes if it's valued. My artist son created his own card game and would research the cultural accuracy of what he drew. He wanted accurate representation. And on the right-hand side, animals and geography are also popular with our young right brain children. Left brain children have stronger short-term memories, thus learn best through memorization, which uses that memory skill, and that is a skill that schools use extensively is memorization because they cater to the left brain side. Right brain children have stronger long-term memories, thus learn best through association, which means uses that memory skill. Association, learning by association means that a, my son, for instance, learned all of his continents many countries and all of his oceans from his interest in animals and whales because he wanted to know where they came from. And so this is him, again, drawing 
Uh, he loved atlases and the visual aspect of those. And he would learn where all these animals are from visually. And he started learning what these countries and continents were called at five to seven years old. OK, so I want to leave time for some questions and answers. But to conclude, I took the time to share just some of the traits of what we call different learners. I took time to share just one developmental learning time frame, mainly the five to seven years old time frame. And look at all the diverse ways we didn't understand to honor another way of learning. Look at all the different activities and subjects interesting to right-brained children that don't align with what's being offered in our schools. I could do the same thing for the 8 to 10 year time frame. I can do the same thing for the 11 to 13 year old time frame. We need more time to do that. But if I'm showing you just one stage and how mismatched it is for these creative different learners, then I assure you it's going to be the same as we continue along. But come high school, it all comes together. Literally, some people will think that your right brain child is stupid or something's wrong with them or they're learning disabled. And yet, by the time they hit high school, they grew out of it. Or somehow these remediation programs we spent years on suddenly works. But in actuality, what it is is they hit the different time frames. For instance, if you're remediating, remediating reading at 5 to 7, but suddenly they learn to read at 8 or 9, is it the remediation? Or is it that they finally reach that time frame that works for them? And that is their readiness factor for learning to read. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, currently, we use the left brain scope and sequence as the gold standard measurement to learning. I hope this presentation has shown that there is another valid way to learn, how that looks, why it works the way it does, and so that we can begin to accept that there is a right side of normal. And this is my contact information, the book that I wrote, because um, I've been talking about this and, and presenting on this for many years now. People wanted to have it all in one spot. So I took on the task over many years to write this book so that it would all be in one, one place. Uh, I also write on my website on it, in my blog, and you can contact me by email. I'd like to open up for some questions for this last 10 minutes for anyone who'd like. And I suppose you can uh, use your hand waving or um, put it in your in the chat room if you'd like me to talk on some more other subjects. I can talk more on other subjects that we need to get to um, with the math, the spelling, the writing, um, other. As we wait, if anyone um, wants to ask a question, um, I talked about uh, some of the traits of those who are right brain that, and how they learn to read. And I talked about how they translate into pictures, how they tend to be better. Cindy? Someone trying to. Uh -huh. Cindy, there's a question here. Um, what percent are left brain and what percent are right brain? Do you have any idea on that? Um, as I said earlier, uh, Linda Krieger Silverman is somebody who um, has studied this population for many years. She's a researcher and has high interest in this, in this population. And she has said that 30% of children are um, very right brain, and another 30% are moderately so. So we're talking 60% of children would benefit from the right brain scope and sequence than that which we find in schools, which values and, and tends to promote left brain thinking. So no wonder so many kids struggle and or even if they, there are some children that can acclimate and move along the system in school, but they're not excited and it doesn't inspire their creativity. And in, in one sense, they're just kind of building skills, but they're not 
uh, stoking their creativity and innovation that makes them feel alive. So it's, it's a large percent. And according also to Dr. Silverman, she has spent years trying to create a test, because we're so big on our test to decide who is right brain, who is left brain, okay? She has spent years trying to create a reliable test that indicates if you're right brain or left brain. And she has come up with something that's on her website. If you um, Google Linda Krieger Silverman, um, I think her uh, company's called like the Gifted Development Center. Um, she has posted it um, available to people. However, she says it still is not as accurate as just deciding and determining if your child enjoys the creative outlet. Basically, that is still the most reliable way to know if your child is right-brained or not, is what they love to do. And I find that so fascinating coming from a researcher who has spent years trying to develop a test that would be reliable, but the most reliable, she says, is what they like to do. Because, really, with a creative person, and cre I like to call them creative people versus necessarily right brain, because um, there's that controversy out there about right brain, left brain. We all know we're using both sides of the brain. We're not just using one. It's a favored or a dominant side of processing. They still don't understand it well. I don't say we should be using this uh, as a um, very literal. It's not a literal translation here. It's figurative to, to classify a segment of traits. Um, let me see where I was going with that. Uh, I've lost it. I, tangent, I, I went in a tangent there. So you'll have to ask another question. <laughs> I lost it. It'll come to me. It seems like... Uh, most of uh, the questions, as I'm reading the, through the chat, you've pretty much answered. I, I'm not looking, I'm not seeing the specific question, but if any of the participants want to ask a question, they could just hit the raise your hand button. Right, and then, okay, and this is what I wanted to say, creative people, if they're not being creative, if they're not expressing themselves creatively, they only half live. It just is the reality of how they, that is what makes them feel alive, is to be creative. And there just isn't that creative expression uh, valued in our schools. And, and to give a quick example, until somebody wants to ask a question, um, I, w I was at a presentation and someone came up and she said, I totally get it. You know, my, my child really loves Lego, and I've been basically removing his Legos from him and not allowing him to play with them until he does his schoolwork. And she totally gets it, and she was so excited that, you know, she understood. And then she said, and that's what she said, she said, so if he does his work, I'll let him play with his Lego. And I thought, no, you're not understanding. Let him play with his Lego first and then he will go off and do these other things. He's trying to tell you what is most important to him is Lego is a staple of learning just as much as learning your ABCs. Um, you just have to understand the context in which they learn it. Um, Cindy Priya has a, a good question. Um, she says, I do believe in readiness a lot, but do you wait for your children to show readiness for something before presenting it? Or do you find that many times kids skip many stages or they don't show overly that they can do some of the things? Okay, I, I think that's actually a great question because what people misinterpret me as saying when I say, typically right brain people don't learn to read till age 10. It doesn't mean you do nothing during the five to seven year stage or any time before that. There is plenty of right brain um, things you can be doing to promote reading. I, I always talk about promoting a positive relationship with subjects, promoting a positive relationship with print, a positive relationship with numbers, a positive relationship with expressing your ideas. 
when you bog down into the skill of it, I'm going to make my child do penmanship to ex learn to then express his idea. You have forgotten that they now don't have a positive relationship of expressing themselves in writing. Um, you're, you're creating a negative experience. So you're creating positive right brain ways. So for instance, um, children's picture dictionaries from five to seven, putting on closed captioning on your television set because then you have a visual with the writing. Um, video games often have, we have to read. And so you can read for them. And they, they actually, uh, again, many right brain children start to learn to read um, through video games. Reading aloud to them, I have in my book how, why, and at my website a, a, a post about why it's so important to read aloud to right brain children. And allow right brain children to um, draw and play with Lego while you're reading to them. That's the other thing, we think they're supposed to be up in our lap following along watching the words, but they're actually uh, practicing their visualization skills. And what they're doing when they're doing their creative outlet while they're listening is they're turning on the right side of their brain so they can listen to that activity. So, so really try to learn the value why they do. You may not understand why, and that's actually why I wrote my book and why I do these presentations, to give a lot of the whys so that it can empower parents to, to give value to what they're seeing. But there are a lot of things that, yes, absolutely expose your children to these things of reading and math, but lots of different ways of doing it. Don't get bogged down in just how school shows it, but bring out these materials. How did my son jump on the pentominoes at five years old, but that I had it available and I was showing my eight-year-old? So he jumped on it. Uh, why did he learn to play piano? Because I was playing piano. Why did my son like ancient history? Because I was taking him to museums. You know, these things, absolutely, you're, you're bringing them out in the world. You're bringing different materials in. I go to bookstores as our, as our family activity night so that I want to see what they're drawn to. What, what kind of books are they looking at? Are they looking at visual books? Are they looking at, at science books? Are they looking at history books? That's what I'm going to then feed that, feed that, feed that. So does that answer that question? Because absolutely, I, I may want to make that clear. I am not about, oh, absolutely do nothing. You should not, not expose them to reading. You know, you know, put them on Starfall, let them play around with it. You can do that. We just don't want to say you're going to sit down and, oh my gosh, you're not reading at six years old. Something's wrong with you. I got to get you an evaluation because you're not learning to read. But when you start seeing these traits coming out and say, wow, I see his visualness coming out and I see his spatial skills coming out. Aha, this is why he's drawn to those things and he is exposed to print and he has a positive relationship with it. So I'm going to keep going in that direction and have faith that it will continue to progress in a right brain way. That's why I didn't fear when my oldest son, who, did, who is a gifted, he's a gifted student, didn't learn to read to nine. He would have been diagnosed twice exceptional because he didn't learn to read till nine, but he went right into adult novels, which is not an unusual zero to hero thing for a right brain person to do. Um, but I didn't have fear because I knew he was intelligent and I knew he had a positive relationship with books. He was around books all the time. Why wouldn't he learn to read? Um, Cindy, I know that the next uh, session's getting ready to start and we need to wrap Absolutely. up. Um, I saw that Chrissy had her hand raised, but I don't think she ever took it. But um, we we have we have gotten the the wherewithal that we need to uh, end, and we really really thank you, Cindy. Um, this was the most interesting session I've had so far, and I really appreciate all the work you've done, and look forward to. Uh, Communicating more. We need to get a book club and stuff like that started. Yes. So we are going to end the session. All right. Thank you. So that people can move on. Thank All you. All right. Thank you.